Thank you very much. Very welcome, everyone. Um, I know it's, a verse, it's the worst thing to start a presentation with an excuse, but we are using some archaeological material uh, in the presentation, which has just been recently updated, and we just got to know a little about this yesterday at the reception. Uh, so we decided to leave it in the, in the presentation in its original form and get the crushing comments uh, later on <laughs> afterwards. Uh, so we're going to deliver a talk about fugitives and survivals in medieval Iceland, and I think the title might need some explanations. Bert Grills is a name, actually, and he is uh, one of the most uh, well-known and today's most famous survivor specialist. He is the protagonist of TV shows and the author of several survival guides uh, and so on. And according to him, to survive uh, in the wild, there are three ultimate prerequisites for a man. Uh, one is to be build an adequate shelter, the second is to find water supply, and the third is to acquire food, respectively. And uh, in this talk, we will contest these modern survival techniques to the description of survival scenes in the Old Norse sagas. Um, so, well, uh, life in the medieval north is often perceived as harsh and difficult, especially when it comes to Iceland. Uh, the temperatures, the winter nights, the scarcity of uh, food, because, well, mostly because of the lava fields and the impossibility for large agriculture, uh, all these uh, aspects shows uh, a kind of a society on the edge of survival. Uh, constantly, the saga mentions regularly, in fact, years of famine, and uh, the livestock and uh, haystock is a constant concern uh, for this society on the edge, a frontier type of society. So, uh, therefore, how did a man, a fugitive, could survive in such harsh condition outside the usual network of solidarity between men? And to answer this question, uh, today we will use textual uh, evidences from the sagas, along with some archaeological findings we will uh, debate probably uh, <laughs> later on, and compare them to the su survival uh, techniques. And hopefully, uh, this will lead to assess how realistic uh, account the sagas are giving about survival, and establish Iceland's specific geography and social structures as determinant factors uh, to approach survival. But uh, first, uh, a quick uh, introduction about what it was to be a fugitive uh, in medieval Iceland. So medieval Iceland was a society without a king, without executive power, without a state, and therefore they didn't have death penalty. Instead, they had outlawry, to make it simple. And outlawry, in theory, is a loss of rights or a loss of the protection of the law. And in practice, it's an exile. And uh, it was mainly used uh, in societies and uh, all along Scandinavia as the main tool uh, against antisocial anti and criminal behavior. And in Iceland, to sum up, there were two types uh, of, uh, of exile. First, uh, the let, what is usually called the lesser outlawry, the Fjordbert culture, which was uh, basically an exile of generally three years uh, abroad. But, and the one which interests us today more was the Skogangur, uh, the full outlawry, which for more was used for more important crime, and which was a uh, permanent exile uh, from the social space. And the Skogangur, so the man of the forest, literally, the outlaw, uh, well, cannot be given food, cannot be transported, and uh, could be killed uh, by anyone. And in a way, between these two penalties, there is a core difference of, uh, of nature. <coughs> because uh, the lesser outlaw was going abroad and didn't, uh, didn't really have to survive per se, because he was leading uh, the life of a free man abroad. He could meet the Norwegian king, integrate his, uh, his, um, uh, his uh, guard, and so forth. Uh, whereas on the other hand, the Skogar mother, uh, the full outlaw was uh, Oferjandi. And if we think about Iceland being an island, it means the whole island was becoming his natural prison. He couldn't get uh, out of, of there. And in fact, this penalty has been described often as a virtual death penalty, that the fugitive was just left to die in the nature. Uh, but yet, uh, we are going to see that this may not have been the case, and that outlaws, in fact, seems to have been able to face natural dangers uh, within Iceland. Yeah, so back to these three main prerequisites. The first and the most important one is find shelter uh, in in the wild, and there, if we look at Iceland's specific geography, uh, it's kind of easy to sort out the possible hideouts in the nature, there's not so many. An outlaw had basically three main options, finding a cave, building a hut, or move to a small island. Uh, however, it seems to be apparent from the narratives that all these three camps were chosen or designed by the outlaws to resist human threat rather than perils caused by the nature itself. 
And now we start with the cave. In Kretir uh, Osmundarsson, the most famous Icelandic outlaw gets advice about a friend where he should stay in the wilds. And the saga reads, then Björn said, I have noticed that there's a good fortress and a hiding place if you use your ingenuity in the mountain beside the river at Hitara. There's a hole right through the mountain that can be seen from the road because the main path lies below it with a scree slope stretching up to it which hardly anyone could scale if there was a strong man at the top to defend the lair. I think the best plan to consider is to stay there because you can go from there to mirror and the sea to provide for yourself. Uh, even though this quote uh, also knows the self-sustainment advantages of this hideout, that is to acquire food and water, because it says you can go from there to mirror and the sea to provide for yourself, uh, the emphasis is clearly on the, on the human threat, uh, which I highlighted. Uh, this is a good fortress, this is a hiding place, and the expression that defending the lair obviously points towards something, uh, a defense against humans and uh, not wild animals, because it would be unlikely that white animal would be able to climb up there or something and we also have kind of a scarcity of uh, white animals in medieval Iceland at the time. So the human threat is highlighted again actually when Gretir moves into the cave because he covered the mouth of the hole with grey homespun clothes which gave the impression that the cave was still open when seen from the path below. So to hide his presence there uh, he fabricates some kind of disguise in order that humans won't spot him there. Uh, the same things apply to hot. The description follows will be from Flo's Tale Saga about the hut of a Norwegian outlaw. On the ledge, opposite the farm, a rockfall has come down from the ridge onto the ledge. The stones are thickly overgrown with moss and lichen. Among the stones, I pitched a tent in the autumn when I, Thorke Kettelson, drove him, the Norwegian, away. It's iron grey, the same colour as the stones. So this is a really hiding place, it's behind a rock fall, it's completely looked like an uninhabited place due to the overgrown moss. And in addition, his, uh, his tent merged the surroundings, it was iron grey, just like the stone. <coughs> so all these patterns represent the defense against humans, uh, human threat, uh, as the saga will later also confirm this when the Norwegian is discovered and chased away from this place. But uh, probably the most uh, notable fugitive residences in uh, Iceland were the islands. Uh, people had obviously different strategies when it came to survival. Uh, struggling in the nature was always easier in a group than alone, of course, but this doesn't necessarily apply that it was easier to survive as well, because uh, the natural perils might be lower in a group because people could cooperate, the, they could get into the attention to the society much more if they were uh, working in a group. Uh, and the nearby communities really suffered heavily the uh, presence of these outlaw bands. The most well-known examples are Drangi Island from Gretis Saga and the island of Holm from Harder Saga. Uh, let's move into Drangi Island. It's again an advice where Gretir or how he should uh, use this island. Your only option, said Gudmund, is to settle down somewhere where you do not need to live in fear of your life. Gudmund said, there's an island in Skaga, fjord called Trengi. It's a good place to mount the defense, because it can only be ascended by ladder. If you could get up there, I cannot imagine anyone would ever hope to overcome you by weapons or trickery, provided you keep a close watch over the ladders. So just to see better, these are the ladders, uh, what protected Gretir from being embarked uh, in the island. And this is even more apparent in Harder Saga, where the outlawed horde, Herder and Geir uh, first reinforces their own farms with fortifications. But then they change their minds to go to an island instead, because uh, Herder says uh, he expected that food supplies would be cut off at the mainland. Uh, uh, do we have a quote? Yeah, okay. Geir ordered fortifications built and said they would not be beaten easily. Hurt said he expected that food supplies would be cut off. And I want us to go to Holm. That island has steep cliffs towards the sea and is as wide as a large cattle pen. It could be approached only from the north. To the west of the hut were hidden trenches. Um, so this kind of, here again, the main problem seems to be the human enemy and not the weather uh, or the food or the water supply, since they have to go to this island because at their mainland headquarters, their food supplies would have been cut off, obviously, by people. So this kind of defensive pattern 
were confirmed by archaeological evidence as well. Uh, internal fortifications were found uh, inside out of caves in Iceland, and uh, in our opinion, or I mean, according to those results, all this pointed towards the fact that um, uh, the selection of shelters was highly dependent on the def defensibility against humans. Uh, since neither the wild animals nor the weather or the capability of providing heat is emphasized too much in these literary accounts, at least. Okay, so now we're going to move uh, to uh, the second uh, aspect of survival, uh, water. He seems, uh, in fact, less emphasized in the narratives, uh, but we still have some uh, examples from it. Uh, Gretir, again, uh, in Drenge Island, uh, received drinking water from holes on the rocks uh, where the rain gathered, uh, and you, you can see it uh, from there and from a small spring running, running under the cliffs, uh, for which he had to climb down dangerous uh, rock ledges. But uh, however, for example, the inhabitants of uh, Hölmurs from Hardalsaga, we already mentioned, uh, had needed water in a more uh, elaborated way. Uh, I quote here, 10 other men brought water from the river, Blackskaya, <coughs> by filling a seal boat with water and pouring it into a tub that was out on home. And in a way, ingenuity was important skills to have if someone wanted to survive in medieval Iceland. And as the account from a Hagar saga reflects, social exile uh, on an island uh, greatly incited the development of uh, special skills to survive. Uh, and uh, the, in fact, the detailed description of the, these scenes is, in our opinion, pre uh, pretty much it summarizes the realistic nature of these events and mirrors uh, potentially a saga author who himself was quite aware of these techniques, or at least had a common knowledge uh, about them. And this awareness of survival techniques uh, is reflected also in other scenes connected with water. And uh, not only uh, ingenuity was required, but also physical conditions uh, were also praised, such as uh, swimming, as and it was <coughs> essential in Greti's case. Uh, Greti had to swim to, uh, twice to obtain fire from another island in a saga in order to save himself and his companion uh, from freezing. And uh, well, even though the, the length of the swimming might be a bit exaggerated uh, in the saga, the need of securing fire to bring back fire uh, must have been indeed a, prerequis a prerequisite of survival. And uh, in addition, there is a certain awareness of um, the procedure of undertaking such a swim uh, as it appeared in the saga, as you can see in the quote here, a very detailed quote, Gretir prepared for his swim. He took off his clothes and put on nothing but a coal with breeches of homespun clothes underneath. He tucked up the coal and tied the bass rope around his wrist and took a cast with him. Then he dived overboard. So this is a very uh, like precise description uh, of, uh, of what he has, how he has to prepare before swimming. And when he swims uh, from Drenge, it even, it even say that he tied together his fingers to be more effective uh, in the swimming. And so the connection with survival uh, is quite uh, obvious, also in the scene where Greti has to swim to the lake for fishing nets left by uh, another uh, character there, who was allegedly himself unable to do the swimming. So the physical condition of swimming seems to have been stressed in great details uh, as well here. We come to the last point. Well, yeah. Um Acquiring food was a constant problem for an outlaw, obviously. He had very limited options, at least if he didn't want to face society. Uh, since, as I emphasized a couple of times, the wild animals were very scarce in the island, and obviously agriculture was impossible for an outlaw. Uh, but from the saga accounts, we hear that they could hunt, for example, um, puffins uh, in Drangi Island, <coughs> ptarmigan, uh, and whatnot. Um, for their meat and eggs, uh, and physical skills were highly relevant here, of course, because mountaineering for climbing up these cliffs in Rangi Island was very dangerous, and probably all the other ones. Uh, we have also accounts about this, for example, from Frost Trader Saga. But uh, <coughs> alternatively, our outlaws could also fish. He got there, settled in there, and since he wanted to do anything but rock people, he took a net and a boat and caught fish to live on. And we picked up this account of fishing uh, from the many other ones to illustrate that acquiring food was largely dependent on the social settings otherwise. As Gretti, he wanted to do anything but rob people, meaning that obviously otherwise he was li living about um, robbing the nearby farmers. And outlaws obviously encountered humans when they were searching for food. Um, 
cattle or sheep was probably the most substantial food supplies um, for them, and these could be received only from the farmers, and thus made food supply mainly dependent on society again. Uh, Horder and, uh, Horder and Geir, for example, in Harder Saga, they stole sheep from the surrounding farmers for the inhabitants of their outlaw island on a regular basis. But also it is noted in Grepter Saga that he and his two companions in Drandy Island ate all the 80 sheep in two years, which was grazed there by the farmers of the nearby communities. Um, it means that they, uh, according to the saga, they eat at least uh, 3.5 kilograms of meat per person per day. Uh, which seems to be a little bit too much, but <laughs> depends on appetite, of course. Uh, so, among other things, these events that uh, the outlaws had to co confront the farmers and the society to acquire cattle and sheep and so on, this caused the downfalls uh, of both Gretti's group and also the island of Holm. Um, archaeological remains confirm this from the, the medieval period too. In the cave of Sulzhatli, different bones of domestic animals were found, but uh, remains of wild animals or seafood were completely absent. And this was interpreted that outlaws dwelling uh, inside the country, they lacked a social network that would give them access to the seafood, which was acquired in the shores of the island. And this strengthens the fact that outlaws mainly live from robbing nearby farmers. And the comparison of bones uh, from this source had actually showed that uh, outlaws were probably focusing on taking away the bigger animals, presumably because uh, uh, they didn't want to do this so often that they have to frequently uh, encounter humans again and uh, again and again. Uh, move on a little bit, um, how they process this kind of food and so on. They have to see what kind of tools assisted an Icelandic outlaw. Uh, in continental outlaw narratives, uh, the, we mostly hear about the bow as a distinctive outlaw tool. If uh, just everybody thinks about the Robin Hood tradition. Contrary to this, in Iceland, the most frequently named object in these sources is the cattle. Uh, this could be important, of course, to cook meat, uh, but also to heat up water and get rid of its toxic elements, if uh, those were present. Uh, another important thing is the fire flint, uh, which is mentioned as a necessary object, but um, this was, of course, important. Uh, because of the bad weather illustrated in the swimming seas above, then finding wood was always a task. Grettir, for instance, in the, in the island when he lives in Drangi, he used the drift wood to provide heat for himself and to cook food. Um, but unlike the bows and the wood clubs of continental outlaws, which could, which could be manufactured in the forest, Icelandic outlaws needed other tools. Judging again from the bone supplies found at Surtsetlir, uh, the chopping of uh, the meat bones suggests that very heavy tools were indeed in the possession of these uh, outlaws. Uh, in our opinion, this was probably axe. Um, however, this was acquired completely the same way as all the other things named above. Uh, like the food, Kretir helped himself to the crofters' belongings, taking whatever he needed from them. He took weapons from some of them and clothing from others. So, uh, just like any other segments of survivors discussed above, shelters, water supply, food, surviving tools were also ultimately connected to the society. This was not possible that you go out there into the forest, you make tools for yourself and you just survive. Um, yeah. Ingenuity was, was of course happier too, as it is noted that, that Grettir produced a rope from bast, and probably fishing, net, fishing nets could be produced uh, on a similar way. However, since the main supplies had to be taken and processed <coughs> by heavy tools, probably weapons, uh, physical abilities were also highly relevant here. Uh, so, to, uh, to conclude, uh, in the medieval north, uh, of course nature was something that should not be underestimated. And there are some examples, in fact, showing uh, some cases of uh, ber berserk here. Uh, it's in Gretis Saga as well, who are found dead, lying on the rock, frozen to death in the morning. So we have some examples of uh, failed survive survival uh, in that sense in the saga. Yet, uh, we would like to say that nature seems a lesser threat, at least in the literary representation, uh, than humans during Saga Age Iceland. And for example, Grettir uh, enjoyed a rather good life when he had only to deal with nature or supernatural beings, let's say. Uh, and this is enlightened uh, in the saga uh, three times. I don't have time to go through the examples, but they are all here. And in all the three instances, in fact, it, it is not nature, but humans <coughs> who disturbs Grettir's uh, situation. 
And to sum up, most fugitives and outlaws were actually uh, hunted down, and there are no textual examples, at, at least to our knowledge, uh, showing nature winning over the normally criminals. And the closest example uh, we could uh, uh, encounter is from uh, Bandavana Saga that I will quote here. Uh, it says, now for a long time, nothing was heard of Hospatbir, he's, he's an outlaw uh, in the saga, Karate's uh, nephew, in fact. Um, then in the autumn, when some men went to round up the weathers, they found a cave in some cracks, and in it a dead man. Uh, beside him stood a basin full of blood, and it was as black as pitch. It was Hospatbir, and people recount that the wound Bialfi dealt him must have weakened him, so that he then died for the lack of food and help. That was the end of him. But here we are told that Ospaker died from starvation, basically. But it's only because he got previously wounded all the times before in the saga he could survive and by robbing and, and so forth. So here it's again the human threat that is at the origin of uh, the, the death, the, the outlaw's death. So in this presentation, um, we tried to enlighten survival in the sagas uh, through three main points, outlaw shelters and strategies to acquire water and food. And all ultimately are linked with the social sphere. And this shows a contradiction, uh, we believe, to the geographical uh, aspect of the island. Even though the intention of the institution of outlawry was to ban someone from society and ostracize him to nature, in reality, it never let someone completely cutting the bounds uh, with society to <coughs> live and die in the wilderness. And thus, Icelandic outlawry was never really a struggle against nature, but against society uh, itself. And so this shows that, as a social structure, the function of medieval outlawry was not to let the criminal die out in the wilderness, as in other parts of Scandinavia, but to actually create a kind of scapegoat, a manhunt, able to channel violence in such a small society. And so, to open up, uh, this raises the following question. Did the sagas actually give survival advice to their audience? And it has been often argued that the sagas were actual manuals for chieftains or for low speakers, giving them examples to learn from. And so we can add today that maybe the saga were manuals for survival as well to the contemporary audience, and this would uh, emphasize even more the educational aspect of uh, saga writing. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a very interesting perspective. Thank you very much. It's like you're saying to the next generation, don't fall out with society. You need them. <laughs> um, is there any questions or comments to that? I'm sure there must be. No, I've got one. Yes, Dana. Do you, do you think to some extent, I mean, the reason people, if they were outlawed, could survive, were that they would, you know, either, they're in Iceland, yeah, to be there you've got to have some sort of survival skills, even if you're on a farm or something in those days. And like, if they're descended from people who are like that, they might have had some genetic or, or being taught a lot of these skills. I, I think it has to do a lot with uh, the social structure of Iceland. Like, there's no cities, there's no urban life. Like, we can imagine if someone very urban in a city, uh, then put in the wilderness, would be unable, you know, mm. to, to figure out all this. And but then in these sagas, you know, for example, we see leaders who are farmers too going out to get the sheep as well. So every this type of society, because it's not very uh, humanized, let's say, and everybody has still to show, you know, skills to manage the farm, that. Survival is not such a problem because they all already know, in a way, how, how to survive. But I think it's connected with the social structure of the time and the non-urbanized uh, aspect. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> okay, Agneta. Uh, thank you very much for the Gisle Sursson. Yeah. Does it, he didn't fit in. <laughs> yeah, in fact, he was called uh, uh, not a real outlaw by some scholars, in fact, because they were expecting the wilderness yeah, yes, aspect. Yes, yes, and, and uh, I was a little bit surprised, but, but uh, because uh, he died, of course, he mm -hmm. didn't survive, but he survived very, uh, very many years. And, uh, yes. so, 30. so why did you exclude him? Uh, because he has, like, he mostly survived through a network of course, of, uh, yes. of, let's say, of, uh, of help by women, especially. Yes. And uh, we didn't have like, time to, to include it, but in general, uh, he doesn't have moments he has to build something for himself. General, he, he keeps you know, going in the underground with his wife or so forth, or he's sometimes said to have, go to a shelter, uh, I think a shepherd shelter. And it's, in that sense, yeah, it's like Olaf Jörgrim, who call him a non-authentic outlaw in that sense. And uh, I think the only interesting point I wanted to mention concerning Gisli that fits this is that, for example, he's said to be extremely good at imitation. 
uh, Ermi Krauka, which is in fact uh, an apax. It doesn't appear anywhere else in the corpus. But again, it's a skill. It's not a survival skill. It's a skill against humans. And the same with Grettir. We often pretend to be Gestur and like, well, how can you not recognize, you know, Grettir? It's a bit strange. But uh, I believe, like, yeah, Gisli is a less good example for it, but it fits but, with the skills of this wise. I think, I think Grettir fits, well, Gisli fits this scene as well. I mean, he lives in the wilderness and he survives quite well, but then he is embossed uh, by a superior number of attackers and he dies because of the human threat again. Yeah. So I don't see the point why he wouldn't fit in to this example. It's, yeah, less extreme <coughs> maybe, but yeah, I think he still yeah. fits. Yeah. Yeah. And then was you? Yes, uh, I was wondering if this representation of the humans as a bigger threat could not be seen as an effect of the literary structure of the sagas, in the sense that sagas will tell stories about interaction, so it will be hard to make worthwhile a story of, like, for example, uh, unless there is a specific reason for it. Mm. For example, in Hegel Saga, when uh, it, a natural death triggers Hegel uh, lament uh, sonato, right? In general, the reasons to represent natural death in stories about social interaction and social conflict will be lesser. Do you think it's a, an effect of the literary interests of the sagas or that it actually reflects directly the fact that human social life was more dangerous than natural life? Do you get where I go? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, this is, of course, the problem of saga scholarship for thousands of years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not sure that we are the ones to decide this, but uh, the detailed representation of these kind of things is always shows an, a certain awareness of this kind of procedure. And uh, this thing that uh, the human threat and more emphasized, this has to do something with ice and specific geographical conditions, which could not be altered in the, in the narrative <coughs> either. So, um, in fact, which was one the higher threat, it's uh, hard, to, hard to decide in real life, but at least in the narrative, it, this one is emphasized. Yeah, your question is is, is good actually. I'm not, I'm not sure that I can come up with a precise conclusion to that, but maybe you can. Yeah, really and help me no, out the that. thing to that is that outlaw narratives often are, have been like shown to have more supernatural aspects. For example, it, you, it was a way to fill up, you know, in the space. Like you don't know what happened to this person, so you have to fill it up. And instead of human interactions, you have supernatural interactions, but still are interaction. But the main point, like we wanted to to show there, is mostly like. How detailed can be these descriptions about like survival and human interaction and what was the interest, as you said, of the saga writing, even for outlaws that are supposed to be totally outside, the interest is always this social interaction. So I think that was the point we wanted to share. And the last questions over here. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's relating to a little bit what you just said about the supernatural uh, element in the saga and sagas. Um, and I wonder if one of the reasons why Greta is successful as an outlaw is because, uh, whereas others aren't, is because it's, it's almost characterised as an animal or something mm. supernatural. Um, all of the, a lot of the exports are to do with showing the strength and this lack of reliance on society. Um, and also, I the word in the English translation describes this cave as a lair, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously something supernatural or a monster or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. This is always the association of the, the, the criminal, you know, with the uh, animals and monsters and so on, you know, thrown outside the normal realm of, of humans. So I think it's a slow progression in Gretis side, you know, there's a lot of prefiguration even when he's a child. He doesn't fit, you know, right away. And so there is this slow process till, you know, going till, yeah, till the wilderness. So I, I think, yeah, this, like, fits at least the characterization. It's like he, he was not fitting from the beginning, and they showed that right from the beginning. To, and he could only have a function as an outlaw, tra a tragic function in that sense. But that's the only place he could have, and we finally found his function, in fact, in the end, because he's praised for this. Did you have a comment quickly? Uh, yeah, quickly. So what is that new evidence from Sir Sadlia? Professor Perry Smith is going to talk about that later. Okay. Right? <laughs> <laughs> You'll have an update in this conference. <laughs> Thank you so much.